Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth in the series of industry updates uh, for the UK and Northern European markets from Tourism Australia. My name is Pete Mills. I'm the Partnerships and Distribution Manager based in London. Uh, this morning, Sally Cope, the Regional General Manager of the uh, UK and Northern European region, will be discussing uh, Tourism Australia's current marketing strategy and insights, followed by a discussion with our global media and advertising agency about consumer habits and media consumption. Uh, we'll also be joined by our colleagues from Tourism Tasmania this morning. Ahead of that, there are a few bits of housekeeping as per usual, which I'll just go through with you now. Uh, for the sake of this webinar, we have muted you all, uh, but we encourage you to send any questions via the Q&A tab at the bottom of the page. Uh, any an unanswered questions we cannot cover in this uh, session, we'll try our best to uh, respond to offline. And finally, the webinar is being recorded and will be available to watch uh, on demand and post event. Uh, so without further ado, I'll now hand you over to Sally Cope, uh, who will give you a brief update and introduce today's guest. Over to you, Sal. Thanks, Pete. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this update from the Tourism Australia team here in London. Um, I'll start by addressing the elephant in the room. I'd love to be able to provide you all with a clear response to your many request questions regarding Australia's border restrictions at the moment. Uh, unfortunately, I can't. As we all continue to navigate these uncertain times, our ongoing commitment to all of you here in market is that we will share updates on Australia's borders immediately when the details are made available to us. It continues to be such a tough operating landscape for everyone at the moment, and we really appreciate that this ongoing uncertainty does add to your challenges. Uh, to that point, I'd like to say if anyone ever wants to contact me directly to share insights into specific issues that your business is facing in the current climate, please do not hesitate to do so. We are continuing to feedback lots of market intelligence from this part of the world to our team in Australia, who can then use that information to inform their discussions with government down there. So with this in mind, we really do need your point of view. In the meantime, we hope that the focus of today's webinar might inspire some ideas that will be helpful to many of you right now. Uh, we've mentioned before that Tourism Australia is determined not to let the brand go dark during this period. Instead, we're really focused on a consistent, engaging and robust marketing strategy to really inspire the dreaming and planning of future travel to Australia. So to tell you more about that, I'm delighted to invite our CMO in Sydney, Susan Coghill, to join me now. Welcome, Suze. Hi, Thank hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. I'll hand over now just to let you run through a few of your insights and examples of the work that's being done, and then I'll pop back in and we can have a chat afterwards. Sounds good. Thank you, Sally. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here with you on Zoom, although I do wish I was there with you guys in person. Better yet, I wish you guys were actually down here in Australia uh, with, with me, with us. Um, oops, I'm going to share my screen right now um, and give me one second while I pull up my update for you. And I'll share with you our strategy, as Sal said, and a bit of the work that we have uh, coming up. Here we go. I'm just going to presentation mode. There we go. Okay. And we're off. Uh, I guess the, the thing that we wanted to talk about first is, you know, bef before we do any strategic work, it's imperative that we think about our, our key audiences, um, certainly our consumers, our industry, and all of our partners, so the distribution, our aviation, and, and KDPs. From a consumer's perspective, we want to make sure that we maintain their demand, we find new ways of, of uh, converting their interest and desire in the longer term, um, and that we don't lose momentum with them um, through this period of, of our international borders being closed. From the industry's perspective, we want to ensure that as many of the operators make it through this crisis as possible, they are the backbone of that Australian experience. So any strategies that we develop needs to take our, our industry in mind or keep our industry in mind. And certainly from our partnerships perspective, making sure that our sales channels do still stay focused on us, not distracted by other markets, make sure that the aviation capacity builds back up as quickly as possible, as soon as possible, um, and, and making sure that we have that to speed the recovery along. Now, there is a very strong argument for continuing to market through a crisis. Uh, in 2010, Harvard Business Review did a study of three recessions uh, in years gone past that showed that the winners in a recession are actually in the minority. It's only about 20% of firms that had re regained their pre-recession growth in terms of profit and market share um, three years after the recession had ended. 
the firms that had maintained or increased their, their advertising investments through the recession, they continued to significantly outperform um, post-recovery, as you can see in these charts here. So the opportunity lies in continuing to invest in our brand and continuing to invest in Australia. Now, we're obviously aware that not everybody will be able to do that. We appreciate that times are very challenging. And the situation that we then find ourselves in is quite different. So if you think about where we were in 2019, um, certainly we were out there promoting Australia, but our state partners were promoting Australia, our KDPs were, our airlines were, et cetera. In 2020, there's less people telling that story. So it's important then that we have a strategy and a plan uh, to, to continue to market Australia and to continue to keep that dream alive. And it's also imperative that we work together uh, as much as possible as well to make sure that we're leveraging uh, all the activity that we can to much greater effect. So we are thinking about our strategy from two perspectives. We certainly can't control the length of time that the Australian borders will remain closed. Um, but what we can do is prepare ourselves to drive as fast a recovery as possible when they do open. So we are thinking about that defend period before the borders open. You know, it's all about maintaining demand, continuing to sustain our industry, um, making sure that we're driving that fast recovery. And it's about continuing to build uh, demand over time. And then making sure that we're ready to attack as soon as we get any indication that, um, that we may have some bubble market markets opening or when all borders open, um, hopefully, uh, you know, as, as soon as possible next year. Um, and, or if any cohorts start to, to come through, we've heard uh, talk about perhaps working holiday makers, for example. So that's something that we're keeping an eye on and making sure that as we build up the, the demand for coming to Australia, that we're also thinking about conversion and building plans with our partners to capitalize on that demand that we have built. So the way that we articulate our international marketing strategies, you know, we, we set ourselves a winning aspiration. Um, and, you know, we look at this both, you know, in terms of the brand that we've built over, you know, the past 10 plus years or so, uh, as well as where we're going forward. So maintaining international demand to protect that previous investment. And you would have heard before that, you know, we've invested a billion dollars, you know, in our brand over the last 10 or 12 years or so, you know, approximately 100 million worldwide uh, annually for 10 years. That's a big investment. And we can't just let ourselves fall off the cliff. So we need to make sure that we continue to invest in the brand, keep up that interest and desire in Australia, and that we're driving that fast recovery as much as possible, or as quickly as possible when um, borders do reopen. So in the period before borders are opening, it's about um, awareness and consideration. It's about dreaming and planning content. Approximately six, month pr six months prior or so, um, it's going to be about moving down the funnel a bit more and about driving intent uh, and, and you know, increasing our spend to create salience prior to borders opening. So salience being very different than awareness, making sure that you know, not just do they know about us, but that we're very much top of mind and top of list when they're ready to start booking their travel. Um, and then when borders open, it's going to be all about converting demand through the, you know, our partner activity um, and driving those bookings. And really important, I suppose, to, to uh, Tourism Australia around the world is that we continue to maintain your faith and trust um, in us as a destination and Tourism Australia as a marketing um, and trade and industry partner as well. So it's all about focusing on the right content, the right message, right channel for the moment. So in this period before the borders open, um, we will be looking at um, baseline activity, um, that storytelling, again, the dreaming planning content, keeping us top of mind. So it's about native content. It's about leveraging new formats and a refreshed um, video strategy with YouTube, um, looking at our social channels. We've got incredibly powerful social media channels. So I think we have the largest following of any, um, uh, any tourism destination um, in the world. So we want to make sure that we are continuing to grow that audience and we're continuing to engage with them. So I'll show you some new formats coming up. And then importantly also um, in each of our markets, building out some really um, powerful uh, content partnerships with key media um, partners around the world as well. So um, I mentioned that we're just trialing some new video formats. So uh, one of the things that we're looking at is um, Australia in 8D. 8D is an audio format, it's sort of a surround sound type of experience. So uh, we'll be launching these in the next few weeks. Um, uh, it, the, they're themed based on the beautiful colors of Australia. They're an Im amazing immersive audio experience, but it's gonna tie to native content on australia.com that we can push out. We'll have the videos that we'll be um, PRing and sending around as well, and certainly promoting through our social media channels. So that's one example of how um, we're trying to mix up and, and refresh our storytelling. 
Uh, some of the work that we've been doing down here in Australia for our domestic audience uh, has been around road trips. So we've created um, a whole new road trips hub on Australia.com. We've got new mapping functionality, new itinerary builders. We have, I think, something like 130 new itineraries on the site now as well. We're building out new video content, promoting it through our social channels. Um, and also leveraging it through our media kits. Many of you might have seen um, a lot of the stories that have been coming out, um, a lot of the success we've been having with uh, the pitch packs over the over recent months as well. And that's something that we're leveraging for each of these new formats as well. Um, our Instagram formats um, are, are going really strong actually. So we're starting to uh, create destination guides. Um, listicles are something that we've started um, trialing now with our Instagram stories. Just last week we had a new, um, we had a new format, or sorry, a new story called the top 12 bathrooms uh, or bathtubs in Australia. And just off of that, we got something like 10,000 leads to industry. So we know that our stories play well in these channels. We're going to continue to innovate and try new things uh, and continue just with that, that storytelling. Oops, sorry. Um, also new visual formats for Australia.com as well. So Australia.com remains an incredibly important hub for us um, uh, in the UK and, and around the world, in fact. So we're building out new storytelling formats um, to make sure that the, uh, the content stays fresh and to make sure that we are helping our customers um, plan their trips all the way through their, you know, support them all the way through their, their trip planning journey. Uh, new talent articles available, so uh, leveraging um, influencers and other advocates to help um, give us some credibility in telling our stories, uh, you know, through a third party. We're doing a lot of new video content in addition to the 8D videos as well, but we want to make sure that we're doing some um, fantastic planning content as well. Uh, so destination guides, for example, or lifestyle content as well. So there's, um, I guess, content that will help you plan your trip, help you see Australia, but also content that really dives into the Australian way of life, the culture and character. So how you can live a little Australian yourself as well. We also have some um, immersive uh, storytelling coming soon as well. And this is, um, this is the type of storytelling where we're, we're bringing in all different types of media, whether it's text, imagery, video, sound, uh, and just telling a richer, deeper story, being able to reflect our, the, the true operator experience a lot better. And you might have seen this in, in um, other media, such as the New York Times or The Guardian. They use this to tell uh, quite in-depth stories, and uh, we think it'll be quite a, quite a game changer for us on uh, Australia.com. So keep an eye out for that in the next couple of months. Uh, we've also been trialing, um, our team in the UK actually has been trialing some fantastic um, new formats with uh, Monocle, for example. Um, I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with the uh, fantastic lifestyle magazine, you know, very travel focused. Um, we did a podcast with them, a five series podcast, uh, which launched just last, last month, I believe it was. And this is going strong. Um, love working with a brand like po Monocle uh, or Condé Nast. So this one was a partnership in their social media channels where we took over the Instagram stories. And this was one of their highest performing stories, uh, I think, for outperforming by you know having a stronger reach something like 64 percent higher than their average instagram story so again we know that we've got the right content we've got great storytelling and we've got partners um, who are lined up wanting to to work with us and um and tell that story with us um the telegraph this has been an ongoing um a long-term partnership for tourism australia and with our state partners as well um, and we continue to have just success after success with uh with the telegraph a significant amount of unique visitors coming uh the unique or excuse me the overall dwell time time on site is quite high as well sitting at over two minutes uh, which outperforms the telegraph's benchmark by a, almost a full minute uh, which is fantastic and I thought I might also just share with you an update on uh, some uh, on the live streaming event that we had back in May. We've done a little case study video here to uh, walk you through how live from Oz uh, performed uh, in uh, back in May. So stay tuned. I hit play. have faced the most challenging period in the history of Australian tourism over the last six months. What about 
touring Australia this weekend from the comfort of your own home. You're invited to experience the best of Australia with the virtual getaway this weekend. In a two-day bonanza, viewers will be virtually transported to various destinations right around the country. Welcome to the Love Australia Project. Tonight's special actually kicks off what is going to be a bumper weekend for discovering Australia virtually. And here is what you can expect. Welcome to Live from Oz. Welcome to Corumban Wildlife Sanctuary on the beautiful Gold Coast. Welcome to Shark Bay. Welcome to the Northern Territory. Welcome to the Kimberley. Welcome to beautiful Bondi Beach. I love his daughter. Um, really, really proud of that program. That, um, again, 30, 32 live streams across the continent over the weekend. Pretty amazing. Um, but also, I'm really pleased to share with you, if you haven't already seen it uh, in media, and you might have, um, today is the launch of the next um, Chef's Table series from Netflix. And we have one of our very own starring in episode two. Uh, Lennox Hasty is uh, from Fire Door here in Sydney, um, has his own very special episode. And I went to the launch last night uh, at Fire Door and I can't tell you what an amazing restaurant is and what an amazing chef he is and what he does with Australian native ingredients and flavors and it's, it's wonderful. So please put it top of your list next time that you're coming down. Um, these projects, um, th these type of broadcast programs we know has a, has a real impact on perceptions around the food and wine and food and drink offering here in Australia. And it has a real impact on tourism as well. So we know that, um, we know that ben, who, ben from Attica, who was in season one, um, he still gets bookings from that first season. So um, we're really happy and proud to be uh, a part of a program like this and supporting um, uh, a chef like Lennox. Last thing, uh, I guess, of the of this slide deck I want to share with you guys is just a reminder about our TA resource resources hub. Um, I'm sure Sal and the team have spoken to you guys about it before, but we wanted to take this opportunity because it's never been more important to keep Australia top of mind um, and make sure that we're driving that fast recovery. And we're here to support you in all of your efforts to do that. Um, we launched this hub back in July. It's a single point of access to um, our brand assets and content. The content that is um, housed here on this hub are specifically um, designed for our partners uh, globally and they're licensed to be uh, used. So please, please do make use of them. Um, they can be used for ad hoc media requests as they arise or um, media or PR materials or your marketing materials. Um, it includes things like logos, guidelines, images, video selects. Um, there is a focus on bushfire affected regions as well. Um, so please, uh, please do access that. There's articles, media kits, PR materials, etc. And it does get refreshed monthly. I've got the URL there at the bottom of the slide. So write that down, resources.australia.com.au. Um, and please do, please do take advantage of that. And I think with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I think Sal and I are just going to have a bit of a chat now. If you're there, Sal. I am. Thank you, Sue. Yeah. So much content. Thank you. When you sort of see it all grouped together like that, it just goes to show the enormous um, effort and work that's been going in in the last few months. So uh, really appreciate you running through that. It was, I would add, it's just, it is a small part of what is in the works, by the way. There's still, there's still much more to come. And yeah. we've briefed all the teams and market. We're working quite closely on bespoke plans. So um, yeah. stay tuned and please collaborate with us. Yeah. 
Now, Suze, um, your career has been pretty diverse, a stellar career, some might say. You've worked for some big brands, News Corp, uh, Qantas, Westpac. Um, have you ever experienced anything like what we're going through at the moment? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And nobody has. Uh, nobody has. It is just, it is the perfect storm from the bushfires to the pandemics to the borders closing to the state borders closing it's just it, it's an incredible incredible time you know it's a health crisis topped with a financial crisis yeah. i do want to remind everybody however that we will return to normal times there will always be a a, a return to the mean um there will be an, an enduring impact from the from the pandemic, certainly. Um, and some things have sped up like digital uh, adoption, e-commerce, et cetera. But ultimately, um, just know that the world will settle, you know, and, and things will, will balance out. I know the media loves to talk about changes in society and we're all completely different from this. Um, and yes, the impact of the coronavirus is massive at the moment, but it will settle. We will emerge from lockdown. We will go back to our lives and we just need to make sure that we keep that in mind and that we don't make you know rash changes or assumptions about that and i think one of the people who talks about this really well is uh, jeff bezos who talks about um you know he often gets asked um what is it what is changing about people you know what is why why is society and why are people changing and actually what he's most interested in is what are the unchanging things about people and that is how he has built his business what are those enduring truths about people and ultimately we will get back to that so we'll see our way through this so while we're in it now um do you have any tips for our audience on your approach to planning marketing activity when we're in such a fluid and really uncertain environment yeah i think my advice is for everybody to find a balance of your principles and being able to pivot. And I think that is so, you know, we, we've been talking a lot as we've been doing our plans about um, pivoting without panicking. And the way that you do that is having a strong sense of your own principles. What is that fundamental truth about your brand and your, your business um, that guides what you do, how you serve those customers, um, and it guides your decision making with consistency as well, because it's consistency that builds brands and brands drive business over the long term. Um, and of course, I don't have to explain pivot. It is the word of the year. We are all living, pivoting and pirouetting and changing. But the yeah. challenge is how do you make those pivots um, that serve your business while remaining true to who you are, uh, as, as again, as a brand and as a business. Um, so yes, try new things. Just make sure they align uh, with your core business and uh, with your consumer need. Certainly, if you can afford it, now is a great time to invest. You know, you can steal market share at a relatively uh, a lower cost in market, uh, in theory. Um, and it's an opportunity to do that perhaps when it's a little less cluttered for, for a particular category. Appreciate not everybody will be able to do that. Um, probably another reason then that we should be trying to collaborate and work together as much as possible. Absolutely, could not agree more. So if you were a um, managing a marketing for a, a tourism business over in this part of the world right now, um, what would you be prioritizing? Um, I hope it's not too self-serving to say, I would say um, working with us, <laughs> work with TA. We're here to support you. We really wanna work with you. We wanna collaborate with you. Um, you know, Sally, you and the team do these webinars. Um, you make assets available. Um, you are going to be doing your planning and trying to work as much with as much of the industry as possible. So stay connected to us. Um, and as, I think, as you said in the beginning as well, please do give feedback. Please give um, information. That anything that can help um, the team, both in the UK and the team in um, uh, down here in Sydney as well, make the case for you know whatever is required in in each of the markets. Yeah. Um, just to finish up, Suze, I know um, we have talked about, um, I guess, consumer behaviour a bit already, but for yeah. Australia, we've ha actually had a bit of a, a, a double whammy this year. We had first the uh, devastating bushfires and then that was backed up by um, the global pandemic. Uh, do you think that there is going to be a lingering impact on consumer behaviour when all of this is over? Yeah, undoubtedly there will be. I mean, as I say, you know, uh, humankind will, we will settle. We will, we will always, you know, uh, revert to the mean, um, but there will be some lingering effects, you know, and, and the bushfires, which almost seem, uh, you know, 
I don't want to say quaint, but you know, practically, right? They, it seems like a, a lifetime ago. In some ways, the virus has almost overtaken some of the challenges, that, brand challenges we had out of that. Um, I think with the bushfire, you know, the crisis has um, uh, elevated people's awareness certainly of sustainable travel, and I think that's something that we'll we'll need to continue to look at and and build into our plans and strategies going forward. With the pandemic, um, I've got a few thoughts about where that is going. I think, first of all, we've had a dose of our own mortality. I think, you know, with, with the tragedy, sadly, that comes with something like this. And I think there will be a renewed focus on um, the people and the things that matter in life. And I think the need to make some time and space for each other. Um, you know, I, I suppose there has been a bit of a benefit of, of a little bit more time that people have had at home, uh, opportunity to spend with your family, with your kids, et cetera. So as tragic as this has been, um, I think that that has thrown a, um, a spotlight on, on what matters. Um, secondly, I think being cooped up and not being able to travel certainly has made us hungry to get out there again. And I do think that we're going to see a move towards more meaningful experience led travel. Um, and then lastly, as difficult as these closed borders are, I do think the Australian government is doing, it's managing this crisis really well. And I think that plus our really beautiful wide open spaces and fresh clean air, I hope that it, I, I know that it will ultimately help our brand and it will make us a much more appealing destination in the long term. You know, when people might be a little bit nervous about safety, I feel like it's just going to help build our brand and build our story that much more. Yeah, I could not agree with you more. Suze, thank you so much for joining us. It was really, really interesting uh, just to get the insights behind the strategic thinking, to see uh, all of the body of work and the content that's being created. And um, I really hope it's inspired some of our partners to check out the Trade Resources Hub. Um, because there is a lot there that can be used and we're all in this together, uh, very much promoting Destination Australia. So thank you for your time. I know you have to run up, but <laughs> run off. And thank you to everybody watching um, as well. We, we are here for you, we support you, and we really appreciate everything that you're doing to help build our brand, uh, our collective brand uh, as well. So thank you guys as well. Thanks, Suze. Take care. So next up, I'm pleased to introduce Adam Morton, who's the Managing Partner Client Services at Universal McCann. And UM are Tourism Australia's global media planning and buying agency. So they basically help us to achieve the best outcomes from our campaigns here in market. Welcome, Adam. I see you, Sally. So as some background, can you just uh, explain who UM are and your approach to client services? Yep, so as you mentioned, we're a media communications agency. We're part of um, IPG, which is one of the big uh, six uh, global um, advertising networks and we've been working with you guys since uh, 2016. Um, in terms of our approach, um, we recently just uh, evolved our, our positioning, um, to be honest, which was in part, it was a reaction to um, Forrester, the world, uh, world renowned um, market research uh, company who ranked us number one amongst our peers in terms of the strength of our current offering, but also our future uh, positioning uh, going forward. And it was that combined with observing that, you know, communications is really in a sort of a downward spiral of, of short termism that we now talk about future proofing our clients, uh, brands and businesses, which is all about helping them balance short term immediate need and long term business growth uh, about identifying the audiences that need to connect with today, but also what that opportunity is going forward, who's going to be their new customer. Yeah. And then also about how we're agile uh, in the moment and how we can flex and, uh, and change our plans based on what's going on in market, which in the current COVID environment is, 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 is absolutely crucial. Yeah, agility is everything. Pivot without panic, as Suze would say. <laughs> <laughs> so um, with this whole challenging year that's been brought upon us by the um, pandemic, it's forced people indoors, uh, lockdowns, travel restrictions. Uh, through this period, have you observed any really noteworthy changes in um, consumer habits around media consumption? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's been the sort of you know, obvious increases in certain areas, um, TV in all its forms, live catch up um, subscription for any ad funded um, TV, because it's based on a supply and demand model with supply being the audience and demand being the advertiser. 
um, you know, costs were you know incredible for for any advertiser that that could uh, you know be in market. They were getting priced in at a, a twenty year low. No one's seen anything. No one's seen anything like it, and, and, and pricing still pretty low to be honest. Um, online again in all it, it, its forms um, increased, particularly around news. Actually, uh, people really seeking you know trusted. Uh, uh, information from from quality sources so the economist is one of our clients they saw a massive uptick uh, in, in digital subscriptions social as well as people obviously look to connect and audio um, as well uh, radio often seen as that kind of trusted um, voice but also podcasting uh, that's been on the increase for a considerable time now but there was a real injection at the start of lockdown um, Acast, one of the, the major platforms, uh, noted like two million uh, additional new users coming on board around April time. So yeah. those are kind of the obvious things, but I think some of the more interesting um, observations were around if you view the pandemic in terms of a kind of a fear event and then a financial one. So in terms of a fear event, you know, people are people are anxious and then they migrate to kind of what they know, what they're familiar with. So in terms of consumption, again, across all forms, whether it be TV or radio, there was, a, there was an increase in kind of people watching like repeat classic TV, um, old old school music hits and stuff like that, things that sort of made them feel sort of warm and, uh, and familiar. So that happened. But then as we start to move to this financial event, as we were into recession, furlough, um, and in redundancies, unfortunately, going to increase. Um, I think that's going to affect consumption as well, because despite the fact that there were sort of people on furlough and some people had um, pay cuts, disposable income for many was still up because they weren't traveling, they weren't paying for their lunch, they weren't able to go on holiday. So that enabled to fund the likes of Netflix, Disney Plus, Spotify, again, a client that had a huge injection. But you know, when job losses are going to increase, the recession is going to get deeper. Can people still fund those incremental entertainment sources that, 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 they've, that they've been funding over the last six months? I know that Netflix have already um, downgraded their targets for the back end of the year because they think that actually a lot of new consumers, it just brought customers forward and it's not necessarily going to be sustainable for the, for the, for the rest of the year. So it's that fear into financial event is something that we're, that we're monitoring quite closely. Yeah, still definitely very much in the middle of it from what you're saying. So, yeah, yeah, I think we're in that transition now. Yeah. yeah. Um, based on what we were just talking about with Susan, um, you know, the Australian travel restrictions are in place, and we're, as Tourism Australia, trying to keep the dream alive through all of this content marketing. Uh, do you have any insights that you can share with our audience on, I guess, what would be the most effective channels for this purpose? Yeah, I think I think it's interesting because obviously there's lots of conversation at the moment about you know what's appropriate and brands and businesses need to, to show empathy and obviously at the start of lockdown um, we were inundated with messages around how we're all in it together, um, which was which was which was great and it was worthy, but it, it got to the point that consumers were looking for something different. They they, they wanted to to look forward. So I think we're, we're certainly within that environment now. So I definitely echo some of the things that, that Susan was saying in terms of consumers, you know, want want to be inspired and thinking about what's appropriate as well. I think that applies to the channel. I think some of the the media that we could use, um, which might be more effective in the long term, is is difficult to justify at the moment. Obviously, budgets budgets are tight and things such as that. So again, I think focusing. Again, as, as Susan sort of mentioned on those more targeted discovery based channels, uh, mm. digital and social offer lots of opportunity to um, go after sort of high value travellers, still deliver a significant reach, but potentially not in a such a overt way, which some some people might view as sort of potentially inappropriate in, in, in sort of the current environment. But it's, it's absolutely crucial that we need to, to prime audiences so when restrictions are lifted, that they're, they're, that they're ready to act. And, and TA in Australia is obviously front, front of mind at that, at that point. Absolutely. So being a global agency, do you, have you seen anything that's been happening, trends around the world, or any lessons that we've got to learn from experiences in other parts of the world? Yeah, it's, it's interesting how I think everyone's almost like coming together a little bit, but obviously it's it's kind of obviously come from, e from east to west. And one of the um, early things we saw from China as they start to release is, is, is something called revenge spending, where almost there was a lot of uh, spending around luxury goods as sort of pent up consumers. They were starved of being able to go to the shops and stuff. They, they, they splurged um, instantly. And uh, I don't necessarily think that's applicable to, to all markets. And I do think it's 
probably more a, a, a short term short term reaction and rather than the last in this trend, I think, especially as we head towards recession, um, mm. you know, flaunting material wealth might be seen as, as somewhat tasteless. I think now we're seeing more about um, the need for kind of you know experiences. Um, you know, people, people, are, people are craving those. They've been obviously reduced over time, but also whether it's not necessarily luxury, but again, going back to the point about reassurance, people are still migrating towards trusted brands, trusted environments. We're seeing an increase in people, you know, spending on on, on what they know. In recessions, people are more risk adverse. So again, I think there's an interesting um, dynamic there from a from a travel perspective as well that potentially again. Australia could leverage because you know they can the country can obviously deliver that escape that new experience uh, but bridge that you know need for comfort and security well in in a, in a way that you know other other countries other countries can't absolutely which goes straight to Susan's point as well so I, I could not agree with you more on that one um, I read recently uh, there's a concern about a lag of fresh content being made. So the border restrictions have made it difficult for uh, new content to be created. Do you think that is actually a real issue and if that's going to have a longer term impact as well? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely an issue that probably gets sort of forgotten about. I think one of the best examples of that, we had a conversation with ITV uh, quite early in, in lockdown and they, they highlighted that basically they went from having over 250 um, production projects uh, down to 13 in the space of you know a week so you know it's incredible um so it will cre create a squeeze on content obviously restrictions have loosened but it's still you know it's still incredibly difficult to produce the level of content uh, quality content that, that it was sort of six months ago there's lots of knock-on effects obviously I, i'm a celebrity is 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 not being filmed in australia for the first time it's now in, in wales that you know that, that that's one, one example of that so um I think you know it creates challenges, but it creates op opportunities as well. I mentioned podcasts earlier, so actually that's an environment that there's more listeners out there, and there's been an increase in production of those. Whereas obviously people were obviously in lockdown, it's difficult to travel. That's that, that's a medium that is pretty easy to produce and create you know, content at a level of, of what was what was before. And and brands have obviously got a role to to fulfil and and provide content and, and inspiration where you know, there's a lull coming from other areas. Yeah. I mean, we're feeling it ourselves. We've had uh, a few different productions that have been keen on getting down to Australia and it's keeping them interested until they get there. So yeah, it is a real challenge. And I'm a celebrity. My jury's out on that one. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be interesting to see that, yeah, there's, there's rumours that the uh, the celebrities are less enamoured with going to Wales yes. than going to, going to Australia. So they might have some people pull out. We'll, we'll, we'll wait and see what happens there. So um, just to finish up, um, Adam, obviously a crisis such as this, um, it's easy to get sort of stuck in talking about all of the negative impacts on society and what's been happening. But uh, do you think that it can also be a catalyst for any positive change that you can see going forward? Yeah, I think, you know, there's you know, lessons to be learned and I think people are reassessing, um, you know, what's what's important. I think there'll be some positive uh, things that, that, that come out of that. You know, clearly it's been a, a, a strain on a huge number of people, but that has forced people to, you know, or highlight rather the importance of, of mental health and, and wellness. And, uh, and that's not a bad thing and consideration for others. We've run some uh, research recently which which highlighted exactly that that during the pandemic people have become you know more thoughtful they are they are thinking about others they're reappraising their lives they're making uh, positive changes to, to improve their health to connect with others so I think um, you know that that's a good thing mm. I think also the blurring of the lines for many uh, between between work and work and home has, has been difficult but by the same token I think it's highlighted the need to um, you know, create that separation and, and disconnect. So when you are not working, when you are with your loved ones, when you are with friends and family, that you are truly present, that you do step away from media and, and step away from screens and, and give, give everyone your, your all, so to speak, so that, you know, quality time with loved ones you know, is, is exactly that. So I think focusing on maximising that time, maximising that experience, stepping away, um, 
and and put more emphasis and time on around the ones you care about the most I, I don't think it's a bad thing at all yeah that's great advice i um i could not agree more we as a, a team here at tourism australia are now contemplating moving back into the office in london but uh, we would never have imagined that we would be working remotely since march and that's <laughs> extraordinary how effective it's been so yeah yeah i mean it's yeah it's incredible how all businesses just reacted in in the space of a space of a few days so yeah yeah listen i feel like we could keep chatting for a long time but uh, <laughs> unfortunately we can't i really uh, do appreciate you uh sharing those insights with us and um and joining us for the chat today so thank you very much no problem cheers sally thank you so before I hand over to our next guest, I just wanted to remind everyone that we're hosting Australia Marketplace online over three mornings between the 10th and the 12th of November. Uh, this virtual trade show is designed very much to provide a platform to, for you to engage directly with Australian suppliers in a series of one-on-one -on -one pre scheduled meetings. The seller registrations opened a month ago and the buyer registrations are open now. Um, we've had an outstanding response from the Australian industry. We've got um, 300, over 300 um, sellers, Australian suppliers, uh, who are already distributing their products throughout the UK and Europe, uh, registered to attend. Um, this is an opportunity for you to catch up with old friends, familiar faces in the industry, check in and see how they're doing and perhaps an opportunity just to make some new contacts and learn about some new experiences in development. So we really, really encourage you to join us for this. If you haven't received an invitation to register, please let us know and we'll send out the details uh, to you directly. So now I'm pleased to introduce Tourism Tasmania's Susan Rollison, uh, who's the Global Operations Manager West, and she's joining us this morning live from Hobart. Thanks, Susan. I'll hand over you to now. Thank you very much. Thank you, much. Sally. Thank you so much and um, good morning to everyone and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, at Tourism Tasmania, uh, brand messaging really aims to portray Tasmania as the antidote to the stresses of modern day life. Um, so I thought it was only fitting to virtually bring you a bit of Tasmania today. We have a short video which was produced back in May. Um, it's available currently on tazzytrade.com.au. Um, and basically all we ask is that you sit back, um, relax and enjoy a little bit of Tasmania with us.
So I'm hopeful that that made you feel uh, a little bit um, warm and fuzzy, maybe, or a bit more chilled and relaxed. Um, it's a challenging year, as we can all agree, but in Tasmania, we've had to move fairly quickly and almost sort of retrain ourselves to market, for the moment, Tasmania back to our fellow Tasmanians. Um, come December, we're very hopeful we'll be seeing our interstate visitors back on the island again, our fellow mainlanders, as we call them. Um, and at the moment, what we're really doing with our Tasmanian uh, fellow colleagues, friends, family is encouraging them to truly embrace Tasmania, make themselves at home, um, embrace everything that Tasmania would normally be offering to an interstate and international visitor. Um, and so our local interstate campaign um, is running the title of Make Yourself at Home. Um, and what we'd like to do is show you a little bit of what our Tasmanians are seeing on TV um, at the moment, two very short uh, TV commercials. Um, so again, sort of, we're gonna take you back to a little bit of Tasmania, but from a Tasmanian perspective this time. Thank you. Some need to know why it's there how it got there, and where it goes. Others? They're just happy to drift. No homework tantrums. No screen time negotiations, no giving up today and promising to do better tomorrow. Instead, the normally completely inconceivable afternoon snooze. Thanks, Nan. There we go. So I hope I hope that sort of resonates a little bit. You may not entirely get where we're coming from with that, but certainly our Tasmanians um, know what we mean by the inconceivable afternoon snooze um, and being able to actually have your, your grandparents babysit um, and be able to escape just for a little while, just to go away and have a, a short break. So, so that's what we're hitting our, our current audience with in terms of messaging. Um, I'm very lucky to be joined by two amazingly optimistic, resilient, energetic people from our tourism um, industry here in Tasmania. The first person I'll introduce is uh, Kate Bucknell. She's the general manager of the very soon to open Hotel Verge in Launceston. And then I also have Daniel Schoedler, who's our managing director and very recent new owner of um, Premier Travel Tasmania. So welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining. Good morning, good morning. Thanks, awesome. Just straight over to you, Kate. Um, tell, us, tell us a little bit about your hotel career and what's so unique about Hotel Verge? Um, thanks, Susan. Look, I've been working in hotels probably 20 plus years. Um, this is a fairly unique project in, in the fact that it's Tasmanian designed, owned, operated and built. So owned by uh, a local Hobart family um, and I've worked in sort of hotels across Melbourne, London and now back in my hometown of Launceston in Tasmania. So it's really lovely to be part of something in my hometown. Um, the hotel has 86 rooms and about $24 million of investment in northern Tasmania. Also one of the, the newest hotels in the CBD over the last 10 years. So it's a really welcome addition to Launceston um, and very much that central hotel here. So we're, we're pretty excited. With the use of, um, of what we call industrial lux, um, a lot of timbers and concrete and steel and feature lighting. So it's very different property. And it's been designed by um, Cumulus Studio, who's done Sapphire, Pump House Point, and a number of really key hotels um, across Tasmania and Australia. So pretty exciting. So, so great. Honestly, it looks absolutely stunning. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm very excited. You're only a couple of weeks away from opening. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. so we'll be uh, we'll be coming up to visit you shortly, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, we're we're two weeks away. I'm sitting currently in one of our Verge Ultimate rooms, which has only just yeah. got a mattress in yesterday. So I've got somewhere to sit, um, and it and it's yeah, very exciting. Sort of 86 rooms and. Can't wait to open it in two weeks. Obviously, we're opening to Tasmanians, as you just said, but it's a great way to test um, our product in the local market and get that real positive word of mouth. Being independent um, kind of gives us that flexibility as well. So very exciting. Yeah, totally agree. And so for the future international visitor, um, what can they expect from you know, a very much Tasmanian owned and operated hotel? Yeah, look, um, one of the great things, again, being independent, we have this flexibility. Um, a lot of our team are all local, very experienced people. So we're aiming to kind of give this real bespoke Tasmanian experience. Um, where we're located is amazing. So we're walking distance to everything around Launceston and then short drive to a lot of the attractions around. So it's kind of means that if you are touring around, you have that choice of being leaving your car and discovering things on foot, which I think is really key. Um, you're traveling around so we've got free parking and free wi-fi across the property but just allow people to come into the property escape here but then have things on your doorstep as well which is pretty exciting awesome it honestly i think we i think we're very lucky to have um hotel verge and particularly this side of christmas as well it gives us um us southerners something to look forward to in terms of our journeys up north oh, my final question to you um is i guess um, a bit of an insight, you know, what is, um, I suppose, your favourite experience or location in Tasmania and why? Why would you do, will you choose that sort of thing? It, it's hard to narrow down, but I'm Tassie born and bred and I've travelled the world and, and been lucky to do that. Um, but I really come back to Launceston, which is where I grew up and spent a lot of time and sort of two main areas, probably the natural beauty of Launceston. We've got what's called the Cataract Gorge, which is absolutely exceptional. It's five minutes out of the city and it's well worth Googling Cataract Gorge because it's just absolutely stunning. We grew up there as kids jumping in and swimming and um, just it, it's exceptional to have something so close to the city to explore. And I can't um, forget probably the Tassie food and wine, particularly the wine. Um, so we're lucky in Launceston to have both the East and West Tamer, which is chock full of vineyards. So, um, award-winning Tasmanian produce, um, sparkling wines and pinots, which are which are quite incredible and well known up in the north of the state. So, um, yeah, I certainly don't mind um, the, the choice of vineyards, etc. So, yeah, those two probably are, are many. <laughs> Brilliant. No, it is. Lonnie, I think, I think we have to teach everyone as well that if you want to sound local, that you call it Lonnie, not Launceston. Yep. <laughs> um, but it yeah, is an amazing, Kate. amazing part. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, Daniel, over to you. So you've, you've jumped into taking over a travel company at um, quite an interesting and challenging time. Um, tell us a little bit about your background in travel and tourism and you know, what's, what's compelled you to take over Premier Travel? Definitely, yeah. Uh, look, I'm more than happy to just uh, go uh, do a quick recap of my career. You hear that I am from Switzerland originally, and uh, that's the accent that I um, carry with me. So basically, I've learned everything from scratch back in Switzerland. Um, um, I have started as a normal salesperson behind the counter, then went up to a product manager, um, had an office lead, and then I had the chance to work for a boutique um, Australian specialist in Switzerland as well, where I've been invited afterwards to the Colbury West Convention in Adelaide back in 2015. Um, then I had the chance, I was lucky to be um, chosen for a post in Tassie. That was actually my first touching point in Tassie. Uh, and uh, that was also my first contact with Christina Schultes, who was the previous owner of Premier Travel. She led that um, tour and I suddenly fell in love with Tessie because it's such a beautiful little island. And then at one night we went to a pub down at Salamanca. I think it was the, the Wales pub. And then after a few beers inside us, actually this is that what causes when you uh, drink too much beer and, uh, inside us. So um, she offered me a job in Tessie. And then I went home, uh, went home to my wife and said, hey wifey, we need to go to Tessie. And then you could imagine how the face of my wife was. 
Um, but in the end, I convinced her, and then we started all the things, and then uh, after four months, we were in Tassie. So basically, I've then started working to, for Christina on a sponsorship visa um, as a service and touring manager uh, for about a year. But, you know, Tassie has a bit of a disadvantage. It's a bit too cold sometimes, you know, like today. And then I tried to find a bit of warm-up place, I would say. Went over to Perth, Western Australia. Found actually really nice. It was really nice over there, but there was... A, kind of a homesickness there. Then went back to Tassie and rejoined Premier Travel as a channel revenue operations. That was back in 2018. And um, Christina then went into motherhood. She got a baby boy back in June last year. And I've literally run the business already without having her in the office together with my colleagues. And then uh, Christina once decided um, to basically step out of the business and she offered Premier Travel. And well, what, a, what an opportunity. And they said, well, uh, went home again, had that face from my wife again, like that one when I came back from Tassie the first time. And um, I said, look, we could buy premium travel. And said, wow, what an opportunity. And we, we then decided, yes, let's do this. Um, and yeah, now I'm the manager of premium travel. That's uh, such an incredible story from my point of view. And, mm -hmm. you know, currently ask me why do I buy or why have I bought a, a company in the midst of a pandemic? Well, difficult question, but it's simple on the other way as well. So basically, I believe in Tassie, I believe that certainly people are coming back when we can open the, when the borders get open again. Um, it offers so much diversity. It has a, such a beautiful landscape, beautiful animals like you can see in the background there. And an opportunity is certainly that we believe that because we are small, we don't have that much population, um, we can offer that social distancing that we are used to now, and we don't have mass tourism, and I think we have everything what clients are looking for. So this mm. is that what yeah. I believe mm -hmm. is that what makes taxi, and we have the best air too as well. That's it. Lots, lots of fresh air. I have to agree. Yeah, <laughs> We're quite spoiled with, uh, with, with lots of open landscapes. Um, yeah, no, I have to agree. Premier Travel's really, you know, well thought of down here. Um, and, you know, and it has been immensely busy for Premier Travel right up until the start of the pandemic. Um, I know you're busy adapting the business to be able to cope yeah. to our current sort of um, intrastate and then interstate business. Um, but what are you sort of thinking of planning of offering your future international visitor? Yeah, but look, basically when we decided to buy Premier we had a bit another idea, but since the decision has been done that the borders are closed at least until the 1st of mm -hmm. December, um, that we take that as an opportunity to really reflect ourselves, to develop new tools and also relationships. And we believe that we go, or well, we should go a little bit back to our roots, where we started mm -hmm. with. So basically, Premier Travel has started 22 years ago with mainly German-speaking tour, and then Christina actually uh, developed with all the other markets um, for in, in, all, in all over the world. Uh, but we want to go back to, you know, get a better connection with the nature again. We're going we're gonna to take a path onto the sustainability, um, just like connecting with everything, with Tasmania, and show that we are a Tasmanian company who cares for Tasmania. Um, we want to go to this exclusive private touring again, beside of the small group tours that we have. And then also um, what we do, we'll want to have those small group tours and kept at a maximum of eight people so that there is a real feeling of a small group tour. Then we certainly we continue with our um, pool of highly knowledgeable guides and I'm so happy to have those um, individuals in my in my guide pool so basically we have the president of the Australian Orchids Association within our guide pool um, or we have scientists we have teachers we have Antarctic leaders um, and so on and so on so we have a really really great pool of, of, of these uh, leaders and people that can actually provide everything what our visitors expect from us. And Fantastic. I, can, yeah. mm -hmm. I can certainly say that we have a plan what happens with 
that COVID safe. So we are prepared for everything. And mm -hmm. uh, so basically, is that what, we, what we're going to do and certainly continue with everything what was before, but like, um, like these tours in different languages. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. this is what our plan is. Brilliant. No, it is. It really is. I think going to be a strength um, for Premier Travel, and it's you know it's perfectly fitting for for um, I suppose yeah the future traveller that does maybe want a bit more of a bespoke um, tour on a, on a very custom and private level. Um, as as we know, we've got a we've got a very varied skill set in uh, in Tasmania. But um, quickly tell us just at the end. Um, I know we're looking at Aurora Australis. Is this your sort of favourite experience in Tasmania? Yeah, so look, I know that we are talking currently to uh, the Northern Europe uh, people, but and I know that you know Norway or Finland is pretty close to them. They can see the Northern uh, Aurora over there, or the Aurora Borealis. But it's, it's, it's exactly right. So basically, whenever it happens, and actually it happens tonight, um, I'll have to hurry afterwards. So. Um, <laughs> I will go out and hopefully take pictures like these. So basically all these pictures you see um, is that what I've taken by myself. And uh, yeah, that's certainly a spot going down to the beach at night, packing out my camera gear and just sitting there and hopefully capturing such beautiful pictures. This is that what, what attracts mm -hmm. me all the time when I'm in Tessin. That's one of the reasons why I, why I stay in Tessin, why, I'm, why I love this beautiful island. Fantastic. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Um, a real treat. Your photography is beautiful. Um, a big thank you to Kate and to Daniel for joining us. Um, it's a pleasure to have you and um, back over to Pete, I believe. Thank you, Susan. Uh, and thanks for all those fascinating insights from you and your guests this morning. Um, we're really excited about uh, the hotel and Lonnie as well. Um, that wraps up today's proceedings, but before I go, just, I really just wanted to thank all of our guests this morning. So that's Susan Coghill, Andrew Morton, Susan Rollison, uh, Kate Butnell, uh, and of course, Daniel Schrodler. Um, we will be sending out an email with the link to this recording following today's session, and also look out in the coming weeks for uh, the invite to our next webinar. Um, in the meantime, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. So bye for now.